Hello, and welcome to my talk on non-configurationality in GORWA, uh, given online as part of the Rift Valley Network's webinar series. So, new research suggests that GORWA is a non-configurational language, uh, displaying radical pro-drop, freedom of word order, and the ability of sub-constituents to occur discontinuously. This talk presents each of these phenomena and evaluates two competing theories for the phrase structure which underlines this non-configurationality, specifically the pronominal argument model developed by Jelinek, 1984, and elaborated by Baker in 1996, versus the mirror theory model, Adger, Harbour, and Watkins, 2009. Key empirical evidence examined comprises a diverse range of morphosyntactic patterns, some of which have not been discussed in the South Cushitic literature to this point. Before we begin, I'd like to situate myself in terms of what I'll be talking about by uh, providing a bit of context about my work and my interests. So, I began conducting documentary and descriptive work on Gorwa in late 2012 as part of my master's studies and have continued working with this language and its speakers through my doctoral level studies to the present. In 2018, I began basic documentation of the Bantu language Ihanzu, located in the same linguistic area as the Gorwa, as the Gorwa language, approximately 200 kilometers to the west. And this fall, I begin a two-year documentary-focused postdoc encompassing Gorwa, Ihanzu, as well as Hadza, a language isolate spoken near Lake Iasi and still in the same linguistic area of the Tanzanian Rift. In terms of introducing the language, Gorwa, also known as Gorowa or Fiomi, is a South Cushitic language of the Afro-Asiatic phylum spoken in north-central Tanzania. The traditional homeland of the Gorwa people is in the area in and around Babati town and the area circling Lake Babati. Gorwa-speaking communities stretch from here to the Duru River in the west and up to Terengiri National Park in the east. Other natural boundaries do not exist, and Gorwa speakers live together with speakers of Mbugwe in communities as far north as Magugu, and together with speakers of Rangi and Alagua southwards into Bereko. And now, uh, care of Google Maps, we can take a bird's-eye view of the Gorwa-speaking area. So beginning by looking north and turning clockwise with Lake Babati as our pivot, we can see uh, Babati, the largest urban center in the area, located at the head of the lake and the foot of the volcanic Mount Quara, which within the last 100 years has become inhabited all around by both Gorwa speakers and other people such as Rangi. Looking east now, we can make out forested and rolling hills which give way to the Terengiri Plain and the Greater Maasai Steppe, a sparsely inhabited area home to speakers of the Eastern Nilotic language Maasai. Further south now, Gorwa communities become mixed with speakers of Rangi and Alagwa uh, towards uh, Bereko in the Doma region. To the west and on the plain overlooked by Mount Anang is the Duru River, a natural boundary between Gorwa-speaking communities and those speaking Datoga and Iraq. In addition, the sheer rift wall divides the principally Gorwa-speaking lowlands from the Iraq-speaking Mbugu highlands, Mbulu highlands. Coming full circle now, we can see Babati town once again, as well as the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro in the top right corner of the screen, well outside of the Gorwa-speaking area though uh, reachable now following several hours on uh, the now fully tarmacked road. No dedicated language survey has been conducted to determine the number of Gorwa speakers, but based on census figures and observation, I estimate the total number of Gorwa speakers to not exceed 133,000 uh, people. Um, of this number, I further estimate that around 80,000 Gorwa speakers use Gorwa regularly. That is, though people may know the language, they may, for various reasons, not use it. So, for example, a speaker may not speak Gorwa if the people they interact with on a daily basis don't speak Gorwa. They might not speak Gorwa if they are undertaking activities for which Gorwa has not been traditionally used, so, for example, with government officials or at church. Uh, they may also not speak Gorwa if using the language is seen as substandard or unattractive. Um, it turns out that a combination of these factors, among others, uh, discourage speakers from using Gorwa, and more and more, Gorwa speakers are using Swahili to communicate in everyday life. 
Uh, Gorwa is not taught in schools and is typically not written, and fewer and fewer children are learning the Gorwa language, especially in more urban areas such as Babati Town, and it can therefore be considered um, an endangered language. Culturally, and as most groups in the area, the Gorwa are aware that they have not occupied their current homeland forever, and recall a time when they lived elsewhere. At this point in time, uh, stories place the Gorwa with the Iraq, Alagua, and Burungay peoples with whom they live together as what they call brothers. Uh, this perception of common heritage is not surprising given that all of these groups speak similar South Cushitic languages and share common cultural traits. Uh, today, the Gorwa are primarily farmers who also own small flocks of sheep, goats, and zebu cattle. Uh, important crops include sorghum and gourds. Um, but with this said, pastoralism uh, holds a very important place in Gorwa culture, and many Gorwa will identify as pastoralists before farmers. Uh, the majority of Gorwa people now practice some form of Christianity uh, alongside a large Muslim minority. Uh, all forms of modern faith are heavily influenced by traditional beliefs, many of which exist uh, with uh, alongside traditional religion. Uh, as an example of how spoken Gorwa sounds, I've provided a recording of Ako Bu Sakware, who was talking about farming sisal when he was young. <laughs> Ibrabut, bara sa sita na kailo ala ho, tun ata ko ta tin buosiling kare. Mukda uren kun buosiling itsya. Ko dosi mo ta ko dosi mo ta ko dosi alu na di sa babo, alu di si alu kasi ata ko masa wara har kasi si gaza ko merti wai. So for further reading, those interested can consult some of my recent publications uh, on or about Gorwa. Uh, in terms of data, the talk itself will be available at the DOI given below and can be watched on the Rift Valley Network YouTube channel at the link given. Um, the majority of examples used in this talk are from the Gorwa Archive of Language and Cultural Material, uh, which is a digital deposit repository hosted uh, by the Endangered Languages Archive at SOAS University of London. Uh, examples uh, stored here are marked with a unique identifying number, uh, highlighted in red here, such that listeners may resolve each utterance back to its source. We can see that each of these identifier, uh, identifiers is composed of two parts, uh, divided by a full stop. The alphanumeric code to the left of the full stop is the identifier for the recording in which the utterance occurs, and this can be entered into the search box on the deposit page, here highlighted in red, where users can openly access all associated audio, video, and text files for consultation or download. Uh, the number to the right of the full stop corresponds to the utterance number within the recording. As such, users can use ALON to locate the exact utterance uh, within the larger recording in order to re-listen or to hear it in its wider context. Um, further information on this archive deposit, its contents, and how to use it can be found in a recording of a talk I gave a couple of months ago, uh, provided in the reference at the end. Uh, because this talk goes into some detail on the morphosyntax of Gorwa, I would like to first provide some clarification uh, on some of the key features that will occur again and again. The first is suprasegmental operations, and the second is the preverbal clitic complex. First, uh, supersegmental operations refer to morphological operations that cannot be analyzed as segments, but instead affect a syllable or a whole word. common example from English is goose versus geese, where the plural is not indicated by an easily identifiable segment as such, but by a vowel change operation uh, working on the level of the word. 
So such operations are common throughout Gora, uh, but I want to focus on particularly those that take place in the verb. Uh, to start, we can have a verb like dos, which is farm, which, when unchanged, can be interpreted as first person singular. It can also undergo a supersegmental operation, which in this case shortens the vowel, which I annotate as dollar sign a, that's the morpho uh, phonological operation. And the resulting form, das, means either second person singular or feminine. It may also undergo a supersegmental operation, which levels the tone, which I annotate here as dollar sign b. Uh, the resulting form means third person, das. Uh, these supersegmental operations can operate one on top of the other, so to demonstrate this, let's look at the third person form. If we take this form and add a second supersegmental operation to it, the rising tone, indicated by the highlighted morph here, the resulting form is dos. This is the way in which verbs are marked for past tense, the resulting meaning is he farmed. Note, however, that this results in a high degree of ambiguity. Um, Dos can mean he farmed, or, returning to our earlier example, I farm. In fact, the forms presented above are simplified, as in most cases, lexical verbs on their own are ungrammatical without a second element, known in the literature as the preverbal clitic complex. So, taking an example, uh, the example of the inflected verb shown earlier, uh, this form, uh, on its own, cannot mean he farmed, and is instead ungrammatical. In order for it to be grammatical, the lexical verb needs its preverbal clitic complex, in this case, a. Broken down, this form a is composed of the proclitic e, indicating a sole argument, which is third person, an auxiliary, which in this case is phonetically null, and an aspect morpheme, which in this case is realized as a. So together with the lexical verb, this utterance now means he farmed. Now, looking at the transitive verb ta, hit, we see that we can inflect it in the same way. But that again, this form on its own is ungrammatical and not and cannot mean he hit. Um, instead, uh, the lexical verb must be accompanied by a preverbal clitic complex. Uh, in this example, it is mu, highlighted here in red. Broken into its constituent morphemes, we can see the proclitic ng indicating a third-person agent, the proclitic u indicating a masculine patient, and an auxiliary realized once again as phonetically null. Together with the lexical verb, this form means he hit him. If we change the morpheme indicating patient in the preverbal clitic complex, the utterance becomes he hit her. Preverbal clitic complexes are common throughout Cushitic, so see Mouse uh, 2005 for a good treatment of this, uh, but in the southern Cushitic languages, uh, they bear the highest functional load. So consider the form masca, here in the utterance masca dos. Here, broken into its constituent morphemes, we can observe six separate segments. Ma is a question particle, and the enclitic S uh, denotes reason. The proclitic T indicates medio-passive. The proclitics ng and a once again indicate third-person agent and feminine patient, respectively. And once again, we see the auxiliary, which is again phonetically null. Altogether, this form means something like, why is it being farmed, where it denotes something with grammatically feminine gender, like, say, a field. With these two key details outlined, we may now begin to look at the set of characteristics which form the basis of this talk, that is, the non-configurational characteristics of Gorwa. So, non-configurationality can be characterized by three principal characteristics, free omission of arguments, free ordering of arguments, and free splitting of arguments. Gorwa displays all three of these characteristics, and what follows is a detailed examination of each accompanied by examples. The first characteristic we will examine is the free omission of arguments, that is, the ability to drop over nominals and still arrive at a grammatical utterance. A natural speech example is, uh, yeah. I'll play it again, uh, yeah. in which the speaker asks uh, what the winning soccer team is going to do with their prize of a ram. Uh, 
there are no overt nominals in this utterance, but it is still grammatical. Crucially, the argument on the verb will remain the same whether the overt nominals are present or not. We can compare this illicit example uh, with this one. And note that the form of the verb, and more importantly, its underlying morphological components are the same. In fact, if one were to seek a translation of this utterance, which comes closest to the Gorwa idiom, one might replace the free translation of the man hit the boy with something more like the man, the boy, he hit him. In addition to the total optionality with which overt nominals may occur in Gorwa, there's also a high degree of freedom in the ordering of overt nominals, both in uh, relation to the verb, uh, in this case defined as the preverbal clitic cluster plus lexical verb combination, as well as to each other. So in this first example, I'll play it again. Part of a historical narrative. Uh, we, can, we can see the subject, highlighted here in red, uh, preceding the verb, highlighted here in green. This is an example of subject-verb order. In a second example, I'll play it again. Uh, the object, highlighted here in blue, precedes the verb, highlighted in green, giving us object-verb order. Um, neither of these two orderings are particularly surprising. Uh, indeed, verb final is by far the most common ordering in Gorwa. More striking, however, is an example such as uh, this one. I'll play it again. In which the subject, uh, highlighted here in red, uh, follows the verb, highlighted in green, giving us verb subject ordering. And finally, we have the example. <laughs> in which the object, highlighted here in blue, follows the verb, rendering verb object ordering is also attested, uh, though admittedly quite rare. In terms of ordering of arguments in relation to each other, we also see a great degree of freedom. Take, for example, play it again, in which the subject, uh, highlighted in red, precedes the object, highlighted in blue. This ordering, subject, object, is the most commonly encountered in Gorwa. There are also examples such as this one, I'll play it again. In which the object precedes the subject, giving us object-subject order. Finally, and perhaps most exotically, Gorwa permits some of its subconstituents to occur discontinuously, that is, split across another element such as the verb. In our first example, <laughs> I'll play it again. <laughs> we can see that the noun, split from its quantifier, both highlighted here in red, is split across a verb highlighted in green. Uh, the verb intervenes. The opposite ordering of this split, i.e. an initial quantifier split from the following noun, has not been attested. But at least the first construction may be added to our list of split argument possibilities. Nouns may also be split from their demonstratives, as uh, in this elicited example. We can see once again uh, that the noun is uh, split from its demonstrative with a verb in the middle there. The inverse ordering was also judged grammatical in elicitation. Um, but note that another speaker found that although it was grammatical, it sounded a little bit strange. Um, so on this evidence, and given that we know that this natural uh, language data is complex, we'll add both of these forms as valid split constructions in Gorwa. Nouns may also be split from their complement nouns, that is, their possessors, as in... Uh, so the noun is split from its possessor, so the noun work is split from its possessor of God, um, and it's split in the middle by a verb, as well as by an adjunct noun in this case. 
the opposite ordering uh, hasn't been tested. But uh, noun, noun complement split constructions are common and can be added to our list. Nouns being split from their numerals uh, is also attested as this uh, elicited example uh, deemed grammatical by all three speakers uh, that I asked. Note, however, that the opposite ordering was judged flatly ungrammatical in elicitation by one speaker. Though this is a borderline case, as another speaker, when presented with the same phrase, judged it to be fine. So being cautious here, uh, we will admit the noun numeral split constructions, but not the inverse. Finally, noun adjective split constructions also occur, such as this example. I'll play it again. Where we can see the uh, noun phrase small white sorghum is split with an intervening verb. Additionally, the inverse ordering was judged unanimously as acceptable, in which we can once again see the uh, noun is being, uh, is preceding the, or sorry, the adjective is preceding the noun, but it is split by a verb in the middle, that white sorghum. And we can therefore add both constructions to our list. The existence of these patterns is immediately interesting in that they seem to challenge most formal methods of modeling syntactic structure. Just how do you represent these structures and the relations that clearly hold between the constituents on a syntax tree, for example? The pronominal argument hypothesis developed by Eloise Jelinek is one of the popular approaches. Essentially, it proposes that all overt nominals are adjuncts, and that the specifier positions are filled by pronominals, which are the true arguments. Uh, also, there's some kind of mechanism which links the overt nominals to the pronominal arguments, such that they are interpreted in the correct way. That is, subject nominals are associated with subject pronominals, and object nominals are associated with object pronominals, etc. As a practical example, in the utterance garma bahangina tah, the boy hit the hyena, the uh, clitics marking the subject and object within the preverbal clitic cluster are seen to be the true pronominal arguments, uh, which are marked by highlighted boxes here, while the overt nominals are adjuncts, uh, marked here in circles. Meanwhile, a linking mechanism of some sort uh, ensures that garma is interpreted as subject and baha is interpreted as object. Um, this model was uh, elaborated most seriously by Mark Baker, who uh, developed an overarching macro parameter, which, for languages like this, stated that overt nominals are adjuncts barred from occurring in specifier positions, uh, whereas specifier positions themselves are filled by pronominals which act as true arguments, and that overt nominals are in construction similar to clitic left dislocation and are licensed by forming chains with unique null pronominals in argument positions. So in a syntactic derivation uh, following this model, the lexical verb merges uh, with the pronominal argument or the pronominal object in a position headed by v. Next, uh, little v merges with uh, the lexical vp in a projection headed by little v. Strong features on little v draw the lexical verb upwards, uh, accounting for the highlighted configuration. Next, the pronominal subject argument, highlighted here, merges as the specifier of little vp. Next, uh, aspect merges with little vp in a projection headed by aspect. Then, tense merges with aspect uh, phrase in a projection headed by tense. Strong features on tense draw little v upwards, accounting for the highlighted configuration. Next, the null auxiliary is merged as specifier of tense phrase. Either at this point or perhaps later, all of the clitics are drawn to this null auxiliary position, each in the order in which they were merged. Forming the preverbal clitic cluster as we see in the utterance. Following this, the adjunct is added, and then the final adjunct is added to derive the final structure. 
some sort of mechanism operates. Here I use the subscript x to link the overt nominal adjunct here in a circle to the pronominal argument and that pronominal back to its original argument position, both in squares here. The same mechanism, here I use the subscript y, links the object elements. Baker's model actually handles many aspects of non-configurationality quite well. So for example, because the pronominals are the true arguments, utterances, utterances lacking an overt nominal subject, such as this one, are fine. The same applies to those lacking overt nominal objects. And because overt nominals are merged as adjuncts, they could be either right or left merged, uh, accounting nicely for freedom of ordering as here or as here. Problems with Baker's model and the pronominal argument hypothesis in general begin to emerge when one starts to examine the characteristic of free splitting of arguments. I provided a table comparing split constructions found in Gorwa, and as, early, as earlier discussed, and uh, with those found in Mohawk, the model language for much of Baker's discussion. So initially, Baker's arguments are in line with what we can observe for Gorwa. So for example, the noun quantifier splits in Mohawk are explained by the fact that Mohawk quantifier uh, for all may in some cases be adverbial, in which case the split is not really a split at all. So in fact, this argument also fits for Gorwa. So returning to our purported example for a noun numeral or a noun quantifier split, we can see the translation rendered as all those men with the quantifier all split from the noun those men. In fact, as may be seen in this example below, uh, the form theme, all, may function very straightforwardly as an adverb, meaning also. So as such, and realizing that perhaps we require some further testing of these sentences, it may very well be the case that in this first example the form theme is being used in its adverbial sense, and that the semantic difference is just too slim to distinguish in the originally Swahili translations. Uh, noun wh word splits occur in Mohawk, but cannot be tested for Gorwa. This is because all wh questions in Gorwa are either copular, as in this example, or pseudoclefts, as in this second example here. I have yet to find uh, externally headed relative clauses split from their heads in Gorwa. In terms of noun, noun complement or possessor splits, which Gorwa has but Mohawk does not, and noun numeral splits, Gorwa patterns in a, in, a, in a way which would be expected in Baker's model. That is, only one ordering of split elements is possible, and that is following the normal constituent order within the noun phrase. So for example, within the noun phrase, Gorwa allows the ordering noun numeral, and it is this order reported in the split constituents and crucially not the inverse. So we get noun numeral splits and we don't get numeral noun ordered splits. In Mohawk, the ordering within the noun phrase is numeral noun, and in this case it is this uh, order reported in the Mohawk split constituents and not the inverse. And essentially it is this pattern throughout Mohawk. Split constituents will be split in one order and never in the inverse. So note that in the table Mohawk is never yes twice in one row. Furthermore, this order, order in Mohawk will be the order in which the elements occur within the noun phrase, and never the inverse. This pattern essentially allows Baker to preserve the model, which uh, posits that all overt nominals uh, are in clitic left dislocation constructions. Noun demonstrative splits, for example, in Mohawk are described as clefts. The issue arises, therefore, uh, for the two highlighted constructions in Gorwa. So as demonstrated above, speakers accept not one, but both of the possible orderings for these kind of splits. Furthermore, ordering of elements within the Gorwa noun phrase is strict, and if these modifiers were to occur pre-nominally, the result would be ungrammatical. As such, these two final split patterns are essentially different from the ones that are described and explained uh, under Baker's model, and uh, therefore, uh, do not, uh, cannot be explained uh, using that model. Uh, in light of these dissonances between the pronominal argument hypothesis and the empirical data in Gorwa, 
I would now like to examine an alternate proposal adapted to non-configurational languages by Adger, Harbour, and Watkins, 2009. Um, I find this approach particularly appealing in the way that it accounts for the non-configurationality of Gorwa by exploiting a morphosyntactic pattern that, at first glance, appears entirely orthogonal to the issue, but that Gorwa displays quite robustly indeed. So the basics of mirror theory are that overt nominals are full arguments generated in specifier positions. This is obviously a major departure from the pronominal argument hypothesis. And following from this, uh, non-configurational uh, properties arise from two things. Firstly, the availability of arguments to move upwards along a richly articulated clause structure. And second, to, under a telescope implementation of structure building, allows arguments to merge either as the left daughter or as the right daughter of their functional head. So, as mentioned before, uh, the inspiration and empirical justification for Adger, Harbour, and Watkins' mirror theory approach to their uh, target language, Kiowa, was the existence of what they called the clausal mirror, which uh, they write involves preverbal particles and post-verbal suffixes. The latter, and a well-defined subset of the former, occur in a fixed order reminiscent of the Cinque hierarchy. Uh, strikingly, the order of the particles is the reverse of that of the suffixes, so that the functional structure of the clause is mirrored around the axis of the verb. In Kiowa, it is argued that the categories which take part in this mirror are an evidential particle, a mood particle, an aspectual particle, and an aspectual suffix, a mood suffix, and an evidential suffix. Each of these are seen to occur in pairs, uh, corresponding to projections in Cinque's hierarchy, uh, which is shown on the left, their relative ordering dictating by, uh, dictated by their ordering in this hierarchy. I will argue that such a mirror also exists in Gorwa, evidence for which comes from the form of a first mood particle, a second mood particle, a tense particle, and a voice particle, and a voice suffix, a tense suffix, a mood suffix, and another type of mood suffix. Again, each of these elements occur in a pair, in a pair corresponding to projections in Cinque's hierarchy, uh, their relative ordering dictated by their ordering in this hierarchy. A mirror is also visible in Gorwa argument marking, something not seen in Kiowa. Uh, this will require an adjustment to one of the rules of mirror theory, which we'll, we will examine below. Before doing this, however, we will first examine the more straightforward case of the non-argument non marking related particles and suffixes. So, taking our proposed mirror template and expanding it, and ignoring the argument related stuff for now, we will now examine each of the associated morphemes, as well as any evidence that they are mirroring each other. As a reminder, it would be this part of the structure which I would refer to as the lexical verb, and this part which I would refer to as the preverbal clitic complex. Because the suffix ordering in the lexical verb is strict and relatively transparent, and the ordering of the preverbal clitic complex is somewhat less so, I will start with the lexical verb. So, first, consider the form hungr. Put in this example sentence, it means he rests, i hungr. Uh, focusing once again on the part I've labeled the lexical verb, it can be glossed as such. This fits neatly into the template like this. So now compare the form hungurut in the sentence i hungurut, he heals or he convalesces. Crucially, this is intransitive. Uh, this uh, could be said to be put into the middle voice and fits on the template like this with that additional voice morpheme. Um, compare again the form hungurus in the sentence u hungurus, he puts him to sleep. Crucially, this is transitive. It can take an extra argument because of the causative morphology, and it fits into the template like this. Crucially, these suffixal morphemes occur in a strict order which cannot be changed. So take the verb durch, which in this example, a durch, means 
he marries her. Consider now the form duchotis in the sentence a duchotis, he forces her to get married. The ordering is laid out in the template, whereas an attempted form duchosit is entirely ungrammatical. This would seem to be because it disobeys the strict ordering imposed by Cinque's hierarchy. Um, and you never see uh, a, an, or an arrangement like this in Gorwa, where the um, causative, uh, this S morpheme occurs before the T morpheme. It just doesn't occur uh, across the words of Gorwa. Um, this is also the reason why I place tense morphology between voice and mood two suffixes. In fact, there's no way to test if this is true or if this is false. I simply allow the slot to accord with Cinque's hierarchy. Having briefly introduced some of the specific morphemes of the suffix types, I would like now to motivate the clausal mirror by identifying some similarities, both formal and semantic, between the suffixes and the elements of the preverbal clitic complex. The two most striking are the voice and mood two elements, and these will be explored first. So consider the utterance garma mu ai. Focusing on the contents of the preverbal clitic cluster, we see that beside the argument marking, which is part of the verb, it is, the, it is only marked for tense via the null auxiliary, and it would therefore be organized into the slots as such. Now, consider the form garma ku ai, the boy is being eaten. The form is now middle or passive, and the only morphological difference being the addition of the proclitic t. Recall that preverbal pre clitic ordering is often obscured. And disregarding the argument marking for now, it is clear to see that T, uh, the morpheme, precedes the null auxiliary. I'll uh, argue that this is because this T morpheme is a proclitic, drawn to the tense position, and therefore proclitizes to the null morpheme, thus resulting in the surface order. What is striking, however, is this medio-passive clitic's similarity, both formal and functional, to the middle voice-verbal suffix. Uh, it is this similarity that motivates me to classify them uh, under the same voice projection and to identify them as the first peer, pair in our proposed clausal mirror. Moving on, consider the utterance so ai brunwa ar. Again, focusing on the contents of the preverbal clitic cluster, while for now ignoring both the argument marking and the aspect marking, we can see that it is marked for conditional and tense via the null auxiliary. It would therefore be organized into slots as such. Taking now the form so ai brunwas ar, because when he sees a dog, is a minimal pair of sorts with the formal, with the former. The only additional morpheme being the reason morph in the preverbal clitic complex. It would be realized in its slots as such. Recall once again that clitic ordering is obscured. Discounting the argument marking and the aspect marking, the reason morpheme in this case occurs after the tense particle. I assume that this is primarily a phonological phenomenon where the reason enclitic s must enclitize to a vowel. If there is nothing available uh, where it originally merged, in this case bar ends in vowel, it is realized in a position where there is a vowel, in this case, at the end of the perfect aspect, clitic. Uh, the reason morpheme occurring in its original position can be seen in another example, the preverbal clitic complex, maska, in the utterance, so I maska ta, why was the dog hit? Uh, because the question particle ma ends in a vowel, the reason morpheme can enclitize to it, and uh, it does not need to move to a point lower down. Returning to our minimal pair, again, the resemblance between the reason clitic and the causative clitic, both formally and functionally, is striking, and therefore gives me a reason to classify them as a convincing pair in the clausal mirror. The relationship between the preverbal auxiliary and the tense morphology uh, on the verb is less immediately clear. Uh, Note, however, how the auxiliary is associated with uh, tense. I agree with Mickelson that uh, specificational copular constructions lack argument marking, uh, but still have tense, hence the occurrence of the auxiliary in this example. Imperatives, on the other hand, according to, for example, Platzak and Rosengren or Rotil, uh, 
are finite but lack tense, hence the auxiliary is absent. So that's uh, one of the justifications why I think that T, that um, null morpheme that is sometimes realized as A, uh, is associated with tense. From a formal perspective, it could also be argued that the markers are also similar morphologically. The auxiliary could very well be realized in the past tense with high tone, but because the preverbal clitic clusters cannot bear tone, it would never be realized, so we can't test this. So whether or not this is the case, I consider the evidence compelling enough to uh, class uh, this pair as another uh, pairing in the clausal mirror. The final pair is the least certain of them all, but I will assume provisionally that they are associated in a fourth pair in the clausal mirror. And for the sake of completeness, I would also like to point out that the occurrence of two additional aspect slots. Note, however, that they represent two different places on the Cinque hierarchy and do not represent a pair in the clausal mirror. At this point, it would seem that most of the work is done. We have determined which projections are necessary and which seem associated with each other. However, trying to model a richly inflected form, such as that to the left, Desibrkas Dochotis, because the girl is forced to marry, um, it, basically it fails uh, under a standard model. Uh, this is, there's simply no way to get the word order right, nor is there a way to account for the freedom of word order using you know, traditionally acceptable uh, operations. This is where the second element of the mirror theory comes into play. Essentially, a set of special syntactic rules used to account for the effects of clausal mirrors developed by Brody primarily to account for scopal effects in Hungarian, the basic premise has been repurposed for Kiowa non-configurationality by Adger, Harbour, and Watkins, and will now be applied and somewhat repurposed to uh, account for non-configurationality in Gorwa. The first two rules, mirror and telescope, account for the clausal mirror in the syntax. Mirror states that syntactic relation x complement of y is identical to an inverse ordering uh, or an inverse order morphological relation X specifier of Y. Telescope states that a single copy of a lexical item can serve as both the head and the phrase. So the result of mirror and telescope when applied together is a structure uh, like the one highlighted to the right. The derivation of the English phrase, uh, example phrase, uh, proceeds as follows. The object Richard merges with, as the specifier of the lexical verb no, which serves as the head of the lexical big V. Little v, which lacks a morphological representation, merges with big VP. Agent, Andrew, merges as specifier of little VP. T merges with little VP, and Andrew is drawn to the specifier of TP. Because of mirror, syntactic categories are read from top down, uh, following this red arrow, and morphological categories are read from bottom up, following this blue arrow. If spellout occurs at little v, which we'll argue is the spellout locus for English, not for Gorwa, uh, we arrive at Andrew knows Richard. Armed with these new rules, we may now return to our central task of accounting for Gorwa word order. Ignoring the overt argument for now, which is highlighted here, and simplifying the representation of the verb, again, uh, this is provisionally for now, we can derive a correct ordering as follows. The verb, simplified here, merges with voice to form a voice phrase. Uh, and the voice suffix uh, morpheme is realized in the voice head. The specifier of voice merges, this is the voice preverbal clitic. Uh, the voice phrase merges with tense, which is the locus of the null suffix for tense in this case. This gives us tense phrase. The specifier of tense merges. This is the phonetically null preverbal auxiliary of the clitic complex. The tense phrase merges with mood 2, the locus of the causative verb suffix. This gives us mood 2 phrase. The specifier of mood to merges. This is the reason and clitic of the preverbal clitic cluster. Mood to phrase merges with mood one. This is the locus of the final vowel verbal suffix. This results in mood one phrase. The specifier of mood one merges. This is the conditional bar pro proclitic of the preverbal clitic clus cluster. Possibly at this point, each clitic moves in the order in which they were merged, the T 
position, clitoricizing to the null auxiliary, which is the specifier of TP. Now, at the end of the derivation, mirror may apply, reading syntactic categories from top down. This is following the right arrow, or the left arrow, the red arrow on the left, and morphological categories from bottom up. This is the blue arrow on the right. Assuming that spellout is at the lexical verb, big V, the following linearization is produced, which is correct. The final piece of the puzzle, which can now be discussed, is accounting for the free ordering of the arguments in Gorwa. This can be accomplished by the mirror corollary, or at least, as it will be shown, a slight modification to it. The original unmodified mirror corollary states that if the morphological relation is unspecified, then the syntactic relation could be specifier or complement. Here we see a typical relation under telescope, and in fact the one that we used in the last derivation to arrive at the correct, albeit simplified, spellout. The left daughter is the structural specifier, is X's feature sharer, whereas the right daughter is the structural complement, is X's selected dependent. What the mirror corollary states is that another, configurational, another configuration is available. The relation to the right, where the left daughter is a structural specifier, is X's selected dependent, and the right daughter is a structural specifier and X's feature sharer. If the morphological relation is specified, only the left configuration is available, and this is crucial. This is, in fact, why we only see pre-verbal clitics uh, and no post-verbal ones, uh, such as in this ungrammatical tree. Essentially, because each of these morphological relations is specified, that is filled by a morpheme, including meaningful zeros, such as the present tense zero more verbal suffix, then only the relation to the left is allowed to apply. However, if a morphological relation were to go unspecified, such as the highlighted section for this fictitious example language, then both of these relations could be available, allowing, again in our fictitious language, this ordering to occur, or this one. The effects of mirror corollary are exploited by Adger, Harbour, and Watson to allow for argument structures vaguely similar to this one, resulting in SOV order, this one resulting in SVO order, and this one resulting in OSV order. Essentially, it is the unvalued nature of these morphological positions in Kiowa, i.e. that it can be argued that there is no morphological argument marking on the lexical verb, that serves as the source for freedom of word order in this language. In Gorwa, however, I will argue that not only are, there two, are these two morphological relations specified, but these three morphological relations are specified. That is, there is both agent and patient agreement morphology outside of the verb, as well as agent and patient agreement morphology inside the verb as well. This will lead us to a simple but meaningful revision of the mirror corollary. It will be recalled that in the establishment of the clausal mirror, uh, what was referred to as the verb was left out. This meant that the argument marking phenomena were left alone. In fact, uh, in its argument marking, Gorba also displays further mirrored pairs, both for its agent marking and for its patient marking. This should come as no surprise to the listener, uh, as mention of argument marking preverbal clitics and verbal supersegmental operations marking agent have been touched on in detail and returned to throughout this talk regularly. What has gone unmentioned thus far is the morphological marking of patient on the verb, and this will be shown now. In Gorwa, verbs can undergo changes based on the number of their patient. So some verbs, such as kill, undergo a lexical alternation. So to kill, if there's only one object, is gas, and to kill, if there are many objects, is tsu. More commonly, other verbs will undergo an irregular sort of reduplication within their roots. So the verb to climb is tsa'am, if it is one hill being climbed, and tsa'am, if it is many hills being climbed. That this marking occurs closer to the verb than the, uh, than the agent marking can be inferred from the kinds of changes it creates. Note that both of the effects on the stem are suppletive, and because suppletion is subject to locality, following Adger, Bejar, and Harbour, uh, 2003, the patient marking morpheme must be immediately uh, adjacent to the verb. 
This therefore sets up the verbal suffixes uh, and preverbal clitics as two more pairs in the Gorwa clausal mirror. Note, however, that though these patterns are similar, that is, in terms of their mirroring, they are at the same time very different. So first, where all of the clausal pairs introduced above can be said to share a projection in Cinque's hierarchy, the ones below, the ones that we just introduced, do not. Syntactically, they are manifestations of agreement spread across three functional heads, that is, aspect two, little v, and one posited by Marantz and Borer, amongst others, to introduce the object argument, which I've simply called f here. Uh, in this way, they are somewhat diacritical, or parasitic, of the heads under which they exist. Note also that all of the features for which these initial morphemes inflect are, in a way, central to the semantic function of their head, indicative versus conditional on mood 1, non-past versus past tense, etc. None of the features on the new class seem semantically linked to their head, the person or gender features of the agent uh, on aspect 2 and little v, for example, or the gender number features of the patient on f. That is to say, where all the features above are interpretable, these below are uninterpretable. Returning to the mirror corollary, corollary I therefore propose the following revision. Rather than the crucial distinction being whether a morphological relation is specified or unspecified, it is whether the morphological relation is interpretable or uninterpretable. As all of these features below do not contribute to the semantics of their head, or of their heads, I consider them all uninterpretable. This leaves all of the relations open to both configurations, and therefore free argument order should result. So to model this, consider the following utterance, which is both richly inflected and has both overt nominal agent and patient. So, garma baha burna hungurus, which is if the boy put the hyena to sleep. The basic structure is to the right. Inserting the morphemes into the structure gives us the following. Syntactic linearization is from top to bottom, following our red arrow, and morphological linearization is from bottom to top. Since spellout is at lexical v, the string looks like this which is incorrect until we do clitic movement, at which point the preverbal clitic complex reads correctly. And the verbal, the overt nominal arguments must then move to some point higher than mood one phrase, and the resultant order is now correct. Because none of these morphological relations highlighted in red is interpretable, we can exploit them to realize different argument orderings. As such, we have the structure exemplified above, which yields SOV order. SVO order is produced by a switch in configuration at F. And OSV order is produced by a switch in configuration at little v. At this point, and having reached the upper limit of a reasonable presentation, and indeed you, my listeners, patience, I will finish by, li by listing what has been accomplished and what had remains to be done at this point. So first, and following the demonstration of the fact that the pronominal argument hypothesis does not account for the empirical details of Gorwa, it was shown that there is potential in exploring the mirror theory, as it not only accounts for the clausal mirror in Gorwa, but with some minor revision of the mirror corollary, allowed uh, for an account of free ordering of arguments in Gorwa. What was not answered by mirror theory, but what probably can be, is the free dropping of arguments in Gorwa as well as the free splitting of arguments. The latter, especially, can probably be answered with a better understanding of Gorwa morphosyntax within the, uh, the frame of the mirror theory, as well as discourse information structure an undertaking already begun in, in South Cushitic by Roland Kiesling, for example. What was not answered by mirror theory, and may not be answerable by mirror theory, that is, it was not really what mirror theory was designed to account for, but that were raised by Baker's older model and therefore on its replacement are in need of new explanations, are the phenomena of incorporation 
as well as what I call spooky correspondences with so-called polysynthetic languages. So firstly, in addition to non-configurational characteristics, Gorwa also displays at least two types of incorporation. In Baker's pronominal argument hypothesis, extension, incorporation features prominently and is part of the integral explanations. In, Harger, in Adger, Harbour, and Watkins' mirror theory account, however, incorporation is not mentioned really as central to the execution. And though treated in a dedicated appendix, it appears, at least at first glance, that Kiowa incorporation is very different to the kinds displayed in Gorwa. So, as such, any further account of Gorwa morphosyntax will require a new investigation of these phenomena. Along with noun incorporation and non-configurational characteristics, Baker outlined several other key features of the so-called polysynthetic languages. Gorwa, in fact, shares a great number of these seemingly disparate correspondences, to the point that if measured with other languages assessed by Baker, it falls smack in the middle of those languages he deems polysynthetic and those he deems not. So, a bit lower than Ainu, but higher than Greenlandic in his uh, scoring sheet. Whatever the, vi the validity of the pronominal uh, argument hypothesis or the coherence of polysynthetic as a language type, these characteristics are interesting from a typological perspective as well as in their own right. So finally, to conclude, Gorwa displays all the classic characteristics of non-configurational languages, free omission of arguments, free ordering of arguments, and free splitting of arguments. However, the pronominal argument hypothesis, as elaborated in Baker 1996, is unable to capture these patterns of Gorwa, especially in terms of how it splits arguments. Adger, Harbour, and Watkins 2009 mirror theory is appealing in that it may very well account for all non-configurational characteristics in Gorwa, though a fair amount of work is still pending here, and also accounts for the clausal mirror in Gorwa. However, other patterns, once uh, thought to be explained in Baker's model, now require new explanations, including incorporation and spooky correspondences with the polysynthetic languages. Thank you, and these are my references.